Okay, so let's dive into the text. So here's our review slide. We're very familiar with this slide. I just keep adding bullets to it as we keep progressing through the book. Uh, a couple of weeks ago when we met together, we looked at chapters 12 and 15, or we started uh, chapters 12 through 15. Rather, we looked at chapters 12 and 13 uh, as we started to unpack all of this information regarding the seven great beings of the end, uh, so on and so forth. So we're going to continue in that interlude. We're going to continue in this section that, help, that is helping us set the scene for Jesus' return. Now, this is super cool. I don't know how well you can see this on the screen this evening. Not super well. But the reason why I include this is Brandon here. Brandon, are you here? He's not even here. Okay, so we have a member of our church that is a phenomenal artist. So he reaches out to me via email and says, hey, I've been drawing the chapters of Revelation, and here is chapter 14. Y'all check this out. So anybody in here read ahead already chapter 14, so you kind of had a preview of what we're going to talk about? You have the lamb slain, you have the three angels, you have the winepress of God's judgment and fury, you have the horse there with 1600 stadia. This is super cool, super cool. So if you're an artist or you're passing something along, would love to see it uh, and just love to pass that along to folks who are uh, just enjoying our study. So. Uh, I, was, I was significantly blessed by that, and I figured uh, that y'all would be uh, too. So, let's set the scene, shall we? As we dive into our text today, we're going to be in chapter 14. I think I said that wrong just a moment ago. We're going to be in chapter 14. And in chapter 14, uh, it's important for us to remember that John is not pushing the chronology of the book of Revelation forward yet. So we're in this moment of pause, okay? So it's like somebody reached up on the VCR and pressed pause. Now John does this several times. We've looked at uh, uh, these interludes, we've looked at these vignette moments that are asides, they are reviews, they are zoom out pictures, and that's why I have a picture here of this zoom out lens. We zoom out in these moments so that we can see more fully uh, who's involved in the story, who the characters are, what the scenes are, what are the feels, the, the smells, the experiences that are happening in the text. And here in chapters 12 through 15, this is exactly what we have. We have this zoom out moment. So at the end of chapter 11, we have the seventh trumpet judgment blown by the angel, and then John reaches up and press pause. So we really don't know the content of the seventh trumpet judgment until chapter 16. And so in that pause, it's almost as if we feel like we're treading water and barely able to keep our nose above water, and then John just sort of lifts us up so we can catch a breath of fresh air. So we can look over all of the scenery and go, oh yeah, that's that character, and oh yeah, that's that scene, and oh yeah, that is going to happen at that particular moment. Now, I want to give you a real life example of this, okay? So the other night, uh, in our house, we like to watch movies. I think I mentioned that before. So I'm sitting on the couch, and I start a movie. And Kaylin is, is not there with me. She's in our office. She's finishing a picture project, uh, like a picture book or something like that. And so I start this movie. And it goes along, and it is a mystery movie. Anybody here like mystery movies? I love mystery movies, okay? Now, you all know if you're watching a mystery movie, you have to know, or you have to pay attention to all of the details, right? The character development, the scenes, the intricate details of what's in the room and what's not in the room. It's almost like you have to put on your CSI uh, a cap, if you will, so you can follow along and hopefully get to the point where you solve the mystery before the movie tells you who done it. That's the whole goal, right? That's the game I play with myself is, can I get there faster than the writer? So I'm watching this movie, and it's on TV. It's not on a disc that we have. It's on TV. And about halfway through, Kaylin gets done with her project, my wife. 
She goes in the kitchen, she pops some popcorn, she comes in, she sits down, and she starts watching the movie. Well, about two minutes into her sitting down, what does she do? <laughs> Who is that? What are they doing? What has happened in this scene? Why is this person saying that? Is this now or then or in the past or is it in the future? And what did I do? I pressed pause. <laughs> because I'm a good husband. Okay? I press pause and I'm like, okay, I can't rewind it. And why can I not rewind it? Because it's on TV. Okay? Now, I know I'm fooling some of you because it is the 21st century and I do have a DVR, so I could have rewound it and rewatched the whole thing, but we didn't have time. So what do I do? I say, okay, honey, here's this person, here's this person, this person's related to this person, this person's married to this person, this person I think is the one that did it, but this person is this person, this scene is this scene, and this just happened, and we're in a forward scene, but in just a minute we're going to go to a backward scene, and I'm trying to explain everything I can to her to give her the details that if she jumps into the middle of the film, she'll have enough information to help her get to the end. Really, I'm setting her up for the cinematographer's money shot, which is the climax of the film where we find out who done it. That's what I'm trying to do. Now, in that example, I believe this is exactly what John is doing. The reason why he presses pause is because he wants to again Help us understand who the main players are in the narrative of the story, right? That's why last week we looked at all of the different persons. We looked at the woman clothed with the sun, the, the red dragon with seven heads and, and ten horns. We looked at the male child and the archangel Michael, the offspring of the woman, the beast out of the sea, which is the world dictator ruler, the antichrist, right? We looked at the beast out of the earth, who is the false prophet, who will set up the world religion around the, the worship of the beast. All of this is happening so that we understand where we are in the chronology, but also, it's just like a canvas. And we're filling in the details on the outside of the canvas and painting a fuller picture, adding more color, adding more detail, adding more intricacy, adding that extra little tree to the scenery so that when we look at it, we can go, aha, now I see what is happening. John is for us hitting the high notes so that we can together interpret the text with greater skill and precision. So when we look ahead, chapters 14 and 15, what is being detailed to us or described to us is here the earthly and heavenly scenes right before the final rat-a-tat-tat of God's judgment. Because remember, the seventh trumpet, which we're going to look at in detail next week, the seventh trumpet contains the seven bowl judgments. And it's going to happen in rapid succession. There's not going to be much delay in between the judgments. This is going to happen in an extremely brief period of time as God pours out his judgments on the rest of mankind in creation. So in that final rat-a-tat-tat, what, what John is doing is he's helping us see what the scenes are. And we see them here. There are six scenes that set the stage for us to understand what this looks like. So let's look at the first one. And this is what we call the 144,000 on Mount Zion. Now, why do we call it that? Because that's what the text says. It's pretty simple. Okay, so scene one, the 144,000. Now, we met them earlier. Y'all rem remember this? 12,000 from 12 tribes. If you do your math correctly, that yields 144,000. This is from chapter 7. When we were initially introduced to this population, we were introduced to them at the beginning of the tribulation period of time, and now we're here at the end of the tribulation period of time. Let's make a brief observation, if you will. 
how many individuals were introduced to us, and I believe this is a literal number, by the way, not conjecture and not made up, not rounded up or rounded down. So in chapter 7, how many individuals were introduced to us? 144,000. Here, in chapter 14, as we are reintroduced to this population, how many individuals are we reintroduced to? 144,000. Y'all think about this for just a moment. This is not 144,999 or any less. This is 144,000 speaking to the preservation power of God Almighty that those whom he sealed at the initial start of that time of tribulation, he has preserved and kept until this particular time. So this scene in many ways answers the question for us, is God able to preserve anyone during the tribulation period of time? And the answer, of course, is, it's pretty simple from the text, friends, yes, he absolutely is. And why? Because he, we were introduced to 144,000, and now we're reintroduced to 144,000. God has preserved to himself an Israelite remnant that will immediately populate the millennial kingdom, and we'll look at this in weeks to come. So let's look at the context of this scene. Now, the context here is that they are at Mount Zion. Now, literally, Mount Zion is a mountain within the Jerusalem complex. It's on the western side of the city, immediately outside the old city walls. That is Mount Zion. It's one of the mountains that Jerusalem is built on, Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, and so forth. But in the biblical text, Mount Zion can also refer to the entire Jerusalem complex, that Mount Zion is the city of David. It's the city of God, the city of peace, Jerusalem. So here in this text, I'm taking this to uh, allude to the entire Jerusalem complex, the city of Jerusalem itself. Where do we find the 144,000 in this scene that we're looking at? We find them there in Jerusalem. You see these two texts here that speak to uh, Mount Zion. It says it's beautiful in elevation. It is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north, the city, you see it? The city of our great king. That's referring to King David. It's referring to the city, not just the topographical feature in that particular area of the world. And here Isaiah 24 and verse 23 says, then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. As one would expect, that's an eschatological passage speaking to the final rule and reign of Jesus upon the throne of David. And where? In Mount Zion, specifically referring to the parallelism here of the text, the city of Jerusalem. Now, friends, this is not heaven. This is not heaven. This is an earthly scene. And why specifically is this an earthly scene? Because if all of these individuals are in heaven, then my whole argument, friends, that God is able to preserve them through the tribulation period of time and therefore populate the millennial kingdom with them falls apart. But what we see is this godly remnant that God has preserved will be the first entrance, the first fruits, if you will, into that millennial kingdom. So let's read these five verses in the text, and then we'll continue to dive in here to the different pieces. Verse 1, then I looked... And behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000. I want you to notice who is with the 144,000. It is the Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb obviously referring to Christ Jesus. So in this moment, this is referring to the moment as Christ returns. I told you it was right in that, that, that tight moment of the final judgment being poured out and the scenes immediately following and preceding all of that happening. And the question being answered here is, 
Did God preserve the 144,000? The answer is absolutely yes. We move on and says that they had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven like a roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice I heard was like the sound of harps playing, harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these, give us more context and description, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they have been virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits from God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. So let's unpack just a couple pieces here. So, again, my notes say this is likely the same 144,000 from chapter 7. I'd say it's a strong likely, but I like to insert that likely, as you all know, because there's a lot of unknowns here. But I'm likely sure that this is the same 144,000. Chronologically, we've already talked about this. This, and this imagery, this scene anticipates uh, the triumph of the 144,000 and the preservation power of the Lamb. They're still intact at the second coming of Christ. Like we said, he did not lose one. And while, yes, there will be martyrs that die during that tribulation period of time, these that were sealed and marked with the name of the Son and the name of the Father on their foreheads, they are preserved. Now, I want us to quickly contrast what we see here of the 144,000 and what we see in chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. So if we hop back up there to chapter 13 and we start in verse 16, it says, and it, referring to the false prophet, causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of whom? The beast. You see the contrast. So the worshipers of the beast have the mark of the beast on themselves, but the worshipers of God Almighty, the worshipers of Yahweh, those sealed for this day of redemption here, have the mark of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And of course, we know what that marking is for those unrighteous horde. It is the mark 666. Now when we look at this, there's some deep Old Testament imagery. I wasn't able to unpack this last time because we had gone so long. But this, uh, this deep Old Testament imagery takes us all the way back to Deuteronomy 6. Where in Deuteronomy 6, this is what's called the Shema, the confession of faith for the Israelite people. Shema, ya Israel, Adonai, Echad, Echad, Adonai. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and the Lord, er, uh, our God is one. The Lord is our God, the confession of faith. Now, immediately following the confession of faith, what we see is that Moses gives the Israelite people instruction. And in that instruction, particularly verse 8 in this passage, it says that they are to bind the word of God to their heads, to their arms, lash it to their bodies. So if you were to go to the western wall today in Jerusalem, you were seeing an Orthodox Jew that's praying there at the western wall, you will find them wearing some pretty odd jewelry because they will have things strapped to their foreheads, they will have uh, uh, passages of scripture lashed to their arms, the way that they dress, all of that is informed by that Deuteronomy 6 passage. And so the imagery here is, who are they aligned with? Who, to whom is their allegiance owed? On, and to simplify it, who's, whose team are they on is basically what's being asked here. It's to the beast or to God Almighty. For the 144,000, it is to God 
Almighty. John Phillips, the great commentator, says it this way. I love this quote. He says, no other age has produced a company like this, a veritable army of militant believers marching unscathed through every form of disaster. It has been theirs to defy the dragon, to bait the beast, and to give lie to the false prophet. This calling has been to preach the gospel from the housetops when even housetops when even to name the name of Christ called for the most dreadful of penalties. They've been surrounded these latter-day jobs with impenetrable hedges able to laugh to scorn all the grand inquisitors of hell. They have walked the streets in broad daylight careless of the teeth gnashing rage of their would-be torturers and assassins, true witnesses of Jehovah in the most terrible era of the history of mankind. The devil knows about this band of conquerors, and he rides already in agony of anticipation. I love that imagery. The 144,000, the triumphant one, the victors who will make it all the way through. That's the population that we're looking at here. Now in their voices, or their voices rather, join up with this sound that is emanating from heaven. So the praise that is being lifted up in heaven penetrates through the atmosphere and we begin to hear it here on earth. It says that the heavenly multitude is, is, is singing this new song and it's the sound of many harps playing. Now contrast the, the instrument choice. This is not a trumpet. Because thus far in the book of Revelation, what has the trumpet heralded? Judgment. You hear a trumpet blast, that's bad news. You hear a harp, it's beautiful. It's melodic. Right? It captures the context of the moment. It's the beautiful song of the saints emanating from heaven. And the lyric builds throughout uh, the book of Revelation. I wonder if you've noticed this and observed this. The lyric builds. And so we begin this song in heaven with the four living creatures in chapter 5. Then again in chapter 5, it's not just the four living creatures that surround the throne of God and who are calling out in praise, but now a myriad of angels, angels upon angels upon angels are joining and collectively gathering their voices together to praise God and, and to sing this new song. And then in verse 13, it says, every created being lets loose of their voice and begins to sing this song to the great God Almighty, singing his praise, saying blessing and honor belong to the king, right? We know this song, this revelation song that keeps being sung throughout the book. And then in chapter 7, we see how the tribulation martyrs add their voice. And here to the tribulation martyrs' voice in chapter 14, we hear the heavenly multitude joining together and giving this new Revelation song. It is the Revelation song crescendo where all the voices are added, all of the parts are sung, where they're singing out in praise of God Almighty and His Lamb. Did you know that we sing a song entitled the Revelation song? Y'all have to go home and find that song and pull it down on your Spotify or Apple Music or Amazon Music or whatever you listen to and play that for a couple times, I think that would be awesome. Now we go on from here, and we see the exclusivity of the song. The exclusivity, right? This redemption or this revelation song is restricted to the redeemed. Now one might ask, does that mean, I mean, I'm not part of the 144,000, so does that mean I won't know the song? That's not what's being said here in this context. What's being said here is, as in contrast to the rest of the world at the time, the 144,000 are the soul choir. So those in this particular scene are the ones singing the song. They're the ones that know the words. And why do they know the words? Because they've been to choir practice. Sorry? 
Yes, absolutely. All of this is being heard, yes, in this final moment of praise. Because this is following, again, let's look at the scene. This is following the return of Jesus. This is within the, ju the final judgment moments. And so this song emanating from heaven, we see all of this together. Now, the next characteristic that we see about this population is their purity. You see that in the text. It says specifically uh, that they've not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. Now, there's a couple different options here as we look at the interpretation of this text. Option one, this could be a recognition that these individuals who are labeled as men, by the way, these 144,000 men could have led normal married lives uh, during any normal uh, uh, period of time. But due to the tribulation period of time, they chose to abstain in an intimate relationship and were in fact virgins. That would be the base level interpretation of what's going on here, okay? Option number two would be, this could be referring to spiritual purity, spiritual purity, right? So since they are saved, since they are redeemed, they've been washed clean, they are pure, they are virgins. Now, I'm not fond of this particular interpretation. I don't think it matches uh, with the text well, but it is a very popular opinion out there in this part of the text. So I thought that I'd bring it to you for your, uh, for your choice. Number three here, it could be that this is referring to one of the ways the 144,000 proclaimed the gospel or preached to the world was through their moral purity. So let's think about what the world's going to look like during the tribulation period of time with the restrainer removed. Who's the restrainer? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is removed in his restraining activity when the church is raptured. So without the Holy Spirit present, restraining evil during this period of time, what is the world going to look like? Unicorns and rainbows? Probably not. Probably the most perverse, wicked, sexually immoral time that has ever existed in human history. We look at the perverseness of the Babylonians, the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, the Romans, the Americans, the Corinthians, you name it. Put that all together and that's what culture is going to look like. This is going to be one of the most wicked, vile time periods that has ever existed. But one of the ways that the 144,000 proclaimed their love for the Lamb and for God Almighty is their moral purity. They're going to remain pure. Now, why do I think that for me personally, this is the best interpretation? It sits squarely on that word, defiled. Defiled. That word that's used for defiled right there refers to sexual immorality, sexual impurity, right? Which cannot refer to marriage because you're not defiled when you are in marriage, in a marriage relationship. But you are defiled when you fall into fornication or adultery or something like that. So for me personally, when I look at this text, I see that this is one of the ways in which the 144,000 make their allegiance known is how they interact in culture and how they keep themselves pure and unstained from the world around them. Now, I think that should lead to an application point here, friends, that if this is required of the 144,000, we who possess the Holy Spirit ought to live pure lives. This is simple. We're called to, spir to spiritual purity. We're called to physical purity. We're called to sexual purity as the people of God. Look at these three scripture passages. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, for this is the will of God. Everybody, have you ever prayed and asked the question, God, what's your will for me? It's right here in black and white. It says, this is your will, your sanctification, that you would abstain from sexual immorality. The word there for sexual immorality is porneia. Any kind of sexual deviance or sexual sin, Paul is writing here to the Thessalonians, that is the will of God for you to live pure lives. 
First, Second Timothy 2.22 says this, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Flee it. Run away from youthful passions. Of course, this has everything to do with sexual purity. He goes on here in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13, beginning in the latter part of the verse, he says, your body, that is your physical being, is not made for sexual immorality, but the Lord. You're made for the Lord. That God, Ephesians 2, 10, prepared you in advance for good works to be worked out in your life, not for you to be used by the world for any kind of sexual impurity. Then he continues verse 18, just this first phrase, flee sexual immorality. So, friends, there's a lot for us to pick up here and apply to our own lives as we read through the Revelation text here. Just because it's future and we won't be around doesn't mean we shouldn't pick up here and look, oh, God is teaching us something. God's teaching us here to live pure lives, to refrain from being defiled. A great 19th century preacher, Robert Murray McShane, says this, do not forget Y'all listen to this close here. Do not forget the culture of the inner man, and I mean of the heart. How diligently the Calvary officer keeps his saber clean and sharp every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember that you are God's sword, his instrument. I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name in great measure according to the purity and the perfections of the instrument will be success. It is not great talents God blesses as much as a likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of Almighty God. Now he's not referring here to a pastor, a shepherd, a bishop, a minister. He's referring to every believer, a minister of God, a holy person of God. There is power in purity. We move on here, and we notice in addition to the purity, we notice uh, that they are following the Lamb. John MacArthur says that they are partisans of the Lamb. I liked that quote simply because we're in a partisan age, aren't we? So the 144,000 will be of the party of the Lamb. Not the elephant, the donkey, or any other kind of animal. A partisan of the lamb. That they'll be prejudiced to him. They allow no rivals, but they are dedicated to him. And although the beast Gestapo continue to pursue them and, and wish to destroy them, God will preserve and protect them. And we also look at the purpose of these 144,000, that's contained here in the text as well. And we looked at this some when we were back in chapter seven, but I'll review it quickly. A purpose here is that uh, they would be the first fruits. And the first fruits of what? In the tribulation age, they are the first fruits of those who would come into a saving relationship and believe in the Lamb of God with many to follow. First fruits presume second fruits. So who are the second fruits? It's the Gentiles. It's the other Jewish individuals that will come to faith. Those martyred. It says that there's a great multitude in heaven of every tribe and tongue and nation. That referring, of course, to those who are saved in addition to here the 144,000. And their character is blameless. Blameless. They steer clear of any satanic deception or false religion. And the word here for blameless that's used is the same word that's used of a sacrificial animal, prepared to go to the temple, to be slaughtered as a sacrifice, a holy, pure, blameless sacrifice to God Almighty. And so they are a living sacrifice to the king, which allows me to drop in just a brief word of promotion here if you were not able to tune in and hear Pastor Graham's message on Romans 12 this past week, please go back and hear it. That idea of being a living 
sacrifice. It's absolutely essential to the Christian life. With living sacrifices, what do living things do? They move. They get up, they get off. And so us getting back up on the altar, offering ourselves daily as a living sacrifice, it's our spiritual act of worship. All right, we move on here uh, to 6 through 11. Let me read these texts to us and we look at the next scene. Verse 6, then I saw another angel, another here is uh, presuming by the way that it fits with the angels of chapter 8. So this is another angel very similar to those in chapter 8 flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Verse 7, and he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now we're going to look at three angels. But this scene right here, it answers the question, if God preserves the 144,000, right, what is going to be the final end of the unrighteous? What is God going to do with the unrighteous? We understand what God's going to do for the righteous. He's preserved them, but what is God going to do with the unrighteous? So this is an encouragement For those living in the end times, that God is going to complete and bring to full fruition his promise that his justice will flow, that he will get his vengeance on the nations, that he will judge the nations and save his people. God will carry out his justice. So here is angel number one, and is the angel of the eternal gospel, verses six and seven. The context here dictates this message for us. John sees this angel. The angel is overhead, and he has, and don't miss this, friends. This is where just simple observation in the text is key. What gospel is this? It is the eternal gospel. The eternal gospel. Now, there are several gospels given to us in the biblical text. One gospel is the gospel of salvation. Now, a gospel of salvation is, very simply put, you're a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus came, lived a perfect life, uh, died a sinner's death, was buried in a borrowed tomb, got up on the third day, and if you place your faith and trust in him, confess him as Lord, you will be saved. Whoever calls upon the Lord will be saved. That's the gospel of salvation. There's another gospel. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. Now, if you read through the book of Matthew, you're going to see oftentimes where Matthew gives us a very distinctive look at the gospel of the kingdom. This is the good news of the coming kingdom. This is a prophetic fulfillment of what the Old Testament prophets promised in that the Messiah, the anointed one, Mashiach, would come and set up his kingdom on earth. This is 2 Samuel 7, that forever and always King David would perpetually have a ruler on his throne, his son, the son of David. That's the gospel of the kingdom. But here it says it's the eternal gospel. And this is the message that has transcended all the ages. And it's simple. And the angel tells us exactly what it is. The message of the eternal gospel is that God will judge the unrighteous and make all things right. God will judge the unrighteous and make all things right. Now, if you want to do a really cool study, and I was getting super hyped up about this, but I don't have time to teach it tonight. But all three Gospels find their origin in Genesis 3.15. And the Genesis 3.15 moment, if you're familiar with it, is what's called the Proto-Evangelium. The Proto-Evangelium, which means the first giving of good news. This is what immediately follows Adam and Eve's rebellion and sin against God Most High. And as God is cursing the ground, and cursing the woman, and cursing the man, and cursing the serpent, 
we have the proto-evangelium, that in God's justice, there's grace. And it is that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. All three gospels find its origin there in the proto-evangelium moment. It's so cool, but we don't have time to look there, okay? All right, so as we look on here, okay, uh, the message here is God's righteous and righteousness and judgment. You can go back and you can look at that uh, quotation there from John Walbert. Now, this right here is a look back, okay? Remember, when we press pause, we have to look at all the story. We look at key moments before in the movie, and a key moment before in the movie is at the fifth seal. And when the fifth seal is broken, what happened? There was a great multitude of voice joined together that said, how long, O Lord? You remember this? How long, O Lord? And the angel says, shh, just a little while longer. This right here is where the angel says, it's time. It's time. The eternal gospel that God will make all things right. Which, by the way, is an application moment. Because God keeps his promises. Even in the book of Revelation, God keeps his promises. Paul says to the Corinthians that every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Amen simply meaning let it be. Let it be. God says, I agree with his own promises. How cool is that? It's also a warning to the unrighteous here that their end is coming. Let's look at this next verse, verse 8. It's the second angel. It says, another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made the nations drink the wine of passion of her sexual immorality. So here, and oftentimes in the text, what we find is that Babylon can refer to several different things. Babylon can sometimes refer to a literal city. It can refer to the ungodly, immoral, a false prophet religious system. It can also refer to a political system. And by the way, all of these things find their origin in the empire of Nebuchadnezzar, the empire of Babylon. You go back, you study Babylon, all of those three divergences, right, those ungodly uh, streams of thought find their origin in Babylon, right? So here, the, the announcement of the fall of Babylon, this scene that's being set is prophetic. It's prophetic. It's, it's a look ahead for us in how John is writing this because we don't get to the fall of Babylon until chapter 18. So this is a warning of impending judgment, uh, very similar to the first angel. And the fall of Babylon is caused by her sinfulness. Now Babylon, I believe, is referring here to a literal city. I think that that is what's best here. The city of Babylon, reconstructed and rebuilt, maybe even home base for the Antichrist during the tribulation period of time. But we have this city set back up, and Babylon is a, is a, 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 a cancer, if you will, a malignant cancer that spreads quickly through the nations. And Babylon's sin, that is spiritual corruption, sexual perversion, spiritual adultery spreads throughout the nations. And that is her shame. That is her undoing. And any nation that cooperates with this spiritual adultery also buys her demise. You participate in the religion, you also take the sacraments. Here, the sacrament of this particular religion is God's judgment. But we'll get there in chapter 18. The next angel is the third angel. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. It says, And another angel, a third, following them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath poured in full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So here, the message of the third angel is doom for the worshipers of the beast. Anyone whose allegiance is to the beast receives the word of God. You participate in the religion of the beast. As I said, you receive the sacraments, and that is the judgment of God. God's cup of his anger poured out in full strength. Now, this is very interesting here as we look at this because when we look at this idea of full strength, um, I know I'm a Baptist and so I don't have uh, much, if any, um, experience in this particular area, but I hear that when you open up a fresh bottle of wine, it's quite strong, okay? And so what often happens from what I understand is an individual may take that bottle of wine and pour it into a decanter and that decanter will diffuse some of the alcohol from the liquid and therefore removing some of the strength of the bottle of wine. Now in Jesus' day, that's a modern example, in Jesus' day they didn't open up a bottle of wine or a, a sleeve of wine and immediately drink it from uh, the, uh, the container. What they did was they took that wine and they would be like one part to eight parts one part wine, eight parts water, and that was largely due to the fact that their water was not clean, not chlorinated, not purified, and so what did they do? They had to add a little distilling to the water in order that they could drink it and not get a stomach bug. So John's image here is that God's wine is poured out in full strength. It's not got into a judgment decanter it's not been poured out and watered down. They are getting the judgment of God in its full intensity. The nations, the wicked nations, are drinking the judgment of God in its full strength. And note, verse 11, how long it takes place. It is an eternal torment with no rest, no break, and no bench time. Now, this is where, by the way, for those of you following along in theological thought, this is where the doctrine of annihilation meets its annihilation. The doctrine of annihilation that is sometimes adopted by some Christians saying God is just too nice for eternal judgment to exist. And so at some point, God will simply annihilate the ungodly so that they no longer exist. Friends, that's simply not true. Because what John says here in the text, and he uses the strongest language in the Greek he can possibly use, but that this torment goes ages upon ages and into ages, is what the Greek language says. In other words, forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, there's an application point that comes from this that is super important for us to look at. And I have it here on your slide for you, and it is simply reject all forms of false religion. Because you note, why is Babylon falling? Why is this being poured out, this wrath being poured out? Because of participation in false religion. Any form of false religion should be foreign to a Christian. Friends, that goes into the trinkets you put in your home. That goes into the music that you play on your radio or via your stereo system. This goes into the television channels that you watch. This goes into the speakers that you listen to, the books that you read, how you supplement your Christian faith. If you add a little worldly mix in here and a wor little worldly thought here and, oh, that won't hurt here if I do a little bit of this. I think John is speaking to us very plainly here and it is to reject all forms of false religion. As believers, we ought to be knowledgeable about what we are inputting into our bodies, into our minds, into our beings, to ensure that it's not perverted with the satanic deception of this ungodly religion. 
We shouldn't be that way. We, as the people of God, possess the Spirit of God, and we ought to be able to discern. That's the spiritual term. To discern between the spirits. And to ask each spirit, confess the Lord Jesus Christ, or I'm rejecting you. We, as the people of God, must make this a priority. We move on here to the next piece, and this is the next scene. So we're moving on here to the next scene, and this is uh, verses 12 and 13. Briefly, it says this, and here is the call for endurance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. So this answers the question, this particular scene, setting up and explained to us, this answers the question, what will the godly do during this time? Because in addition to the 144,000, we know that there are other individuals that have come to faith in Christ during the tribulation period of time. So what are they called to do? What should they be doing? What What is the commandment to them or the encouragement to them? And what we see here is that yes, God's wrath is severe, But during this period of time, we must endure, must endure. Now I say we, I'm using that as a general synecdoche term there, just meaning believers. We, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ right now, will be in heaven. But there's some imagery here that we're going to pick back up in just a moment. But verse 13 is a direct communication from the Holy Spirit saying, for those that die, Those that don't quite make it to the end, there is a special blessing in heaven. So this particular passage right here, these faithful saint moments, verses 12 and 13, are an encouragement to those that will have to endure, an encouragement to those who will meet their end in the tribulation period of time, that there is a blessing for those that die in the Lord from now and forward. Which, by the way, uh, week number one, I asked you in your homework to look up the Beatitudes. You remember this? The Beatitudes in Revelation, this is the second. So just think about that, we're 14 weeks in, we saw the first Beatitude, now we're at the second Beatitude. We're gonna have a little bit faster now, but we've got some Beatitudes uh, coming. All right, so the next two scenes are somewhat coupled together. This is verse 14 through 16, and this is the judgment of the Son of Man. Let's look at verse 14. It says this, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head, a sharp sickle in his hand, and another angel came out from the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put your sickle in, and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. All right, so let's digest this scene. First thing is, who is this person? Who is this being? Well, I think it's none other than Jesus Christ himself, one like a son of man. I want you to go and study this on your own. This is some homework for you, but there's a connection here between Daniel 7, verses 9 through 14, and here in Revelation 14. One of Daniel's Uh, images or visions that he has is he sees the ancient of days and then he sees one and I quote like a son of man coming out and the ancient of days which is obviously God Almighty elevates and gives dominion to the one like a son of man and this is coupled with the fact that Jesus most often in his own mouth calls himself, the the term that he uses most often to describe himself is son of man. Some 80 times in the Gospels uh, is referred to as the son of man. Now Jesus here has a golden crown referring of course to his glorified state and royalty. He possesses this sickle which is a judgment sickle, right? Now this is supported by what we've seen previously in the announcements of the angels that the judgment is coming. So the time of this particular judgment and when it's going to happen is around the second 
coming, immediately following, immediately before, right there in the mix of this second coming moment. Now, why do I say that? Well, this is fascinating because one would not expect that an angel of God has authority to tell Jesus anything. But when you look here in the text, it says another angel, verse 15, came out of the temple and basically told Jesus, go for it. Now, how fascinating is this? So let's unpack it for just a moment. Jesus says in the Gospels, the Son of Man does not know the day or the hour. What is he referring to? The fact he can't read a watch? That's not it, certainly, right? He's referring to the time of the end. He says that God Almighty has not given the Son of Man the information he needs to know when he's coming. And so, where does the angel proceed from? The temple, which is the presence of God Almighty in heaven. Now, this temple is the heavenly temple, which seems to be a, a, a replica of, or rather the earthly temple is a replica of it, or vice versa, something like that. But it, we have a copy of the temple, and the angel proceeds from the presence of God and tells the Son of Man, reap. Reap. And that's exactly what happens. He says that the earth is fully ripe. The imagery and the words that are used here is, it's like a piece of fruit that has sat on the tree limb a little too long. And it started to dry up and wither. It's not a big, luscious, juicy peach that is immediately plucked and ready to eat. This is one of those peaches that once plucked, it gets thrown out in the horse pasture. It gets disposed of. It gets eradicated. It gets eliminated because it's too far ripe. Now, the imagery here, and again, I'm giving you more homework. The imagery here is the parable of the weeds. The parable of the weeds found in Matthew 13, verses 30 and forward. So, in your, again, in your personal time of study, I want you to go in and I want you to study Matthew 13 and forward. And that gives us this image of Jesus reaping. Now from there, we go to verse 17 through 20. Let's read this. It says, and another angel came out from the temple of heaven. Notice again its origin, the temple of heaven. And he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, and the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. Verse 19. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. So this right here again is couple, this image, uh, uh, scene four and five which is what we just looked at with the Son of Man, and here, the harvest of the earth, they're coupled together, and it answers the question, how is Jesus involved? How is Jesus involved? So this other sickle, right, is in contrast to sickle number one, which is in the hands of Jesus. And so most prophetic scholars, and I tend to agree with them here, that sickle one is referring in general to all of the preceding judgments that have happened from rapture till now. So this, is in, this encompasses a huge period of time, again, from the rapture, so that's seal judgments, that's trumpet judgments, and it's gotten us all the way to the end, and the final judgment call that's going to happen is sickle number two. And Jesus has the command here, God the Father has the command here to put the sickle in and gather the grapes. Now the wording that's used here is this uh, that the grapes uh, are fully grown, and they are completely full and juicy. I mean, these grapes are so full of grape juice that if their skin is punctured, it will squirt the juice out. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, these are full juice grapes. And as the grape clusters are gathered and they're thrown into the wine press, the custom 
here in Israel would be that they would put the grapes in and then everybody would have a stomping party. And I don't mean, you know, like a, a Western line dance party. I mean, you get in there and with your bare feet, you stomp the grapes down. So people would get in the wine press and they'd walk around and walk around and walk around and squish the grapes down and, and then the, the grape juice would run out of the wine press and they'd put it in its sleeves and let it ferment and all of that. But here the imagery shifts quite quickly and it becomes an image of the judgment of God and the image is that as the wine press is tread, it's not grape juice that proceeds. It's the blood of the nations. Now, there's a riddle here, and honestly, it's a pretty difficult riddle for us to interpret, because 1,600 stadia is approximately 200 miles, and if you were to drop a pin in Jerusalem and draw a 200-mile a uh, uh, radial circle from Jerusalem, it basically encompasses the entire Holy Land. It goes up into Syria, it goes to the Mediterranean Sea, it goes over into Edom, ancient Edom, goes over almost into Egypt, but it basically encompasses the epicenter of earth, the epicenter of human uh, life, which is Jerusalem, which is Israel, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. And so what most scholars think is this 1600 stadia that's being referred to is this seems to be not only the epicenter of all of civilization, but it seems to be the epicenter of all of God's wrath being poured out at the very end. There are other places in scripture that seem to suggest that the world's armies have now amassed themselves outside the walls of Jerusalem. And this right here is an imagery of God's annihilation of the nations at the very end. The ungodly, the wicked horde, the, the satanic armies, the, those that are following and worshiping the beast and listening to the false prophet, they come to the walls of Jerusalem. The 144,000 contained within the walls. Jesus is uh, returning, and it's this moment where he completely annihilates the nations. And it's 200 miles radial circle around Jerusalem where God just completely annihilates. And as God treads the winepress of his fury, the blood splatters up on the horse's bridle. Now, this is going to be probably the only time in the book of Revelation where you hear me say, I don't think there is literally blood like a, a swimming pool, like filled up, up to the horse's bridle. But I do think that the blood will be so bloody and so prevalent that horses will, will look as though they've ran through a pool of blood, splashing that high and so much blood as as Jesus is victorious in this harvest moment. Now, as we move on here, and I know I'm running short on time, and I think I'm going <clears> to <throat> slice us here and come back to verse, uh, chapter 15 next week. But what we see here is, just in this one, these couple of chapters, is we see a basically an outline of the entire book. Just in these couple of chapters. We see the appearance of the godly remnant. We see a testimony to the Gentiles. That's the unbelieving individuals that God's judgment is coming. We see the fall of Babylon, which is the city center, the city state, the religious center of the beast. We see the doom of the beast worshipers. We see the blessedness of the martyred, martyred saints. We see the harvest of the earth, and we see the wrath of God on all the world. That right there is eschatology 101. That's the end 101. That's it. And so when we look at the end, here is the outline. As we press forward tonight into just a time of application to bring us to a close, I want us to look at five separate um, applications quickly in review. Number one, we said that there's power in purity. And I want to reiterate that point because every believer in Jesus Christ is called to purity. Number two was that we need to follow the lamb at all costs. 
sort of glazed over that quite quickly, but this is, this is the cost of discipleship, the 144,000. They followed the lamb wherever he went. Now, I know what the nursery rhyme says, right? Mary had a little lamb, and the lamb went wherever Mary went. The writers got that a little bit backwards because the follower of the lamb goes wherever the lamb goes. Good little dad joke there for you. Follow the lamb at all costs. We also said that we need to reject all kinds of false religion, no matter the cost, no matter the shortcomings, no matter the shortfall, we reject all false religions. This last application here, I said there were five, there are four. This last application here is I want to go back to this idea of endurance. This, go back to this idea of endurance. We saw this in chapter 14 in verse 12 where we said that there is a call to endure for the saints. And I want to pause here and just think about this idea just for a couple of moments as we bring our time to a close this evening, this, this idea of endurance. And when I think of endurance, I immediately think of long-distance running, right? It's called long-distance running because you have to possess a certain kind of endurance. Long-distance running is technically two miles or longer, or approximately three kilometers. Now, my personal belief on running is I don't run unless someone's chasing me, and I try to do everything I can to defend myself so I don't have to run, okay? I don't mind the elliptical. I don't like to run. I blame it on my knees. It just kind of is what it is. I don't like to run. But I remember one day when I was running a lot, and there was something that you needed to have in order to be a great long-distance runner, and that was this this stamina, right? This aerobic strength that my lungs could pull in enough oxygen to populate my body with the oxygen needed so that I could continue to run and keep pace. I needed this stamina, but something else that I found out when I was running is that I desperately needed mental strength. I needed the ability to set my mind on something ahead and keep moving forward and give myself a goal, right? I remember my football coach said, anybody can do anything for 30 seconds. That's basically a football play. Anybody can do anything for 30 seconds. But a long distance runner? When you're out there in a track and you gotta run in circles again and again and again and again, I get bored. You need mental strength. Sometimes the Christian life is a run of endurance. Because you're doing the same thing again and again and again. And endurance is a theme in scripture that is regularly emphasized to us. That we must be, as people of God and followers of Jesus, men and women of endurance. That we possess stamina, that we keep believing, that we endure, if you will, through any kind of hardship. Now John emphasizes this, emphasizes this many times in the book of Revelation. In fact, Revelation 1.9, John says that he is their partner in tribulation and the kingdom and patient endurance that is in Christ Jesus. What's the source of our patient endurance? The source is the Spirit of God in us, the Spirit of Christ in us that we could endure. He celebrates the endurance of the church of Ephesus, the church at Thyatira, and the church at Philadelphia. And we're called, even in here, uh, chapter 14, to endurance. Paul tells Timothy, if there's anything that you should pursue, pursue godliness, pursue righteousness, pursue love, and pursue endurance. Now, there's specific categories that endurance oftentimes is coupled with. The first category is suffering or persecution. Scripture tells us to endure suffering, to have a long uh, long suffering patience to possess this in Christ Jesus. Scripture tells us to endure temptation. That doesn't mean, it means to not submit to it. Endure it, be strong through it, that in temptation you endure through to get to the other side. Paul tells Timothy that someday that there will be individuals that will not endure sound teaching. I think he's referring to right now, not in this room, but in this age. 
not enduring sound teaching. The application here is, as people of God, we ought to endure sound teaching. That is, to submit to it. We're also to endure evil, patiently enduring evil. And why? Because we know the end of the book. Finally, Paul says that we're to endure everything. As if those categories weren't broad enough for us. Endure everything so that someone might come to know Jesus. It's an evangelistic effort. Our endurance is evangelistic. And our key example of endurance is Christ. I want you to write down these passages of Scripture. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Hebrews 12 and verse 3. The endurance of Jesus. And then Hebrews 13 and 13. The key takeaways here, as far as endurance goes, is that we're to pick the fruit of suffering. Pick the fruit of suffering and be patient in trial. To possess endurance and steadfastness, which produce character and produces hope. We see this in Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, and James 1, verses 2 through 4. Where James writes, brothers and sisters, when you experience various kinds of trial, endure them with joy. Because trials given to us produce endurance, steadfastness, character, and hope. That there's, there's a dividend to pay in that. We're also not to grow weary or faint-hearted. That's a takeaway for us in endurance. That we are to share the message of Jesus and endure the no in hopes for the yes. You understand what I'm saying? When you share the message of Jesus, oftentimes the reason why Christians don't share the gospel, the good news of salvation, is because they presume someone's going to say no. Endure the no that you might get the yes. Continue the conversation, in other words. Share the good news of Jesus. Also listen to the word and pray for endurance. This is Colossians 1 and verse 11. Pray for endurance. Finally, the image that's given here to us is that we're to run the race. That we are to lay aside any encumbrance, any weight, anything slowing us down. We lay it aside and we look to Jesus. The two passages of Scripture here are so important. It's 1 Corinthians 9 Verses 24 through 27, I'll read this to you. It says this, Do you not know that all runners, when they run, they race, but only one receives the prize? So run that you might obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we, believers in Jesus, we receive the imperishable one. So Paul says, I don't run aimlessly. I don't run crazy with my arms out everywhere, but I run with a goal in mind. I run with a purpose in mind. I run with endurance that, for that upward call, he would say. That upward call to Christ Jesus. He says, I discipline my body. Talk about fleeing sexual immorality. Discipline your body and bring it under control. Lest after preaching, that is proclaiming the word of Christ, I would be found disqualified. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. This is the last verse, and I'm done. The writer of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also, here it is, lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely to us, and let us reign with it, race, excuse me, run with endurance, there's our word, Run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Jesus endured it for us, to set the example for us, and how we are to endure it, so that 
we might be gathered together with Jesus to the right hand of God the Father in glory. Now, I know we're in Winter Olympics time, and other than curling, Winter Olympics really isn't my thing. I like curling because I'm convinced it's just a Canadian redneck sport. I mean, some of the teams looks like just a bunch of dads that got together for a weekend because they wanted to get away from their kids. Let's be honest. I really like Summer Olympics, however, and one of the races that I love watching in Summer Olympics is the 800 meter dash or the 800 meal, 800 meter run. And why? Because it's a long distance run and you have to gauge, right? And, and runners use the runner in front of them, right, as wind block. It's strategy about this running. So if you're running the 800 meter dash, you wanna get behind someone because they break the wind in front of you. They, they push the air and you have less resistance and it helps you run and not burn your energy. Oftentimes, the person that wins that race is not the person that was first for the majority of the race. It's the person who was third, fourth, or fifth. And why? Because they're modeling their pace and modeling their stride after someone that is in first. Jesus has completed this race for us. He's given us the example of faith. He is the founder and perfecter of our faith. Amen? And in that, he has set the pace for us. He's guided our stride. He's helped us see how we are to run it and we are to follow his example and to lay aside every encumbrance and to endure until Jesus returns or you and I get put in the ground. We're to endure the race that God has set before us and endure the suffering, enduring the trial, enduring the teaching so that we might look, act, and love a little bit more like Jesus every day. Amen? When we come back next week, and this is actually better, we're going to look at chapter 16, uh, 15 and 16. They fit really nice together, and we'll go from there. Okay? I hope to see you next week. We'll be back in that room. Let's pray, and we are done. Father God, we thank you so much for this time of Bible study, and we do pray, Father God, that you would help us to endure. This is a calling for the saints of God to endure. Let us endure till you send Jesus to gather us, or let us endure till you take us home. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have an excellent evening.